This episode of the Structural Engineering Channel is brought to you by Collier's Engineering and Design. Collier's Engineering and Design is a multidisciplinary engineering firm with over 1,800 employees in 63 offices nationwide and growing fast. Collier's Engineering and Design maintains an internal culture that is nurtured through the promotion of integrity, collaboration, and socialization. Their employees enjoy hybrid work environments, continuous career advancement, health and wellness offerings, and programs and projects that have a positive impact on society. Collier's Engineering and Design stays on the cutting edge of technology, and their entrepreneurial approach to expansion provides personal and professional development opportunities across the firm. Leadership's dedication to the well-being of their employees and their families is demonstrated throughout the wide range of benefits and programs available to them. For more information, visit the career page on their website at colliersengineering.com. Welcome to this episode of the Structural Engineering Channel, a podcast focused on helping structural engineering professionals stay up to date on technical trends in the field and to help them succeed in their careers and lives. In this episode, we are talking to Greg Souls, PhD, P-E-S-E, and P-E-N-G for my friends in Canada. He is a structural principal, structural engineer, and the technical authority for seismic and wind engineering for CBNI, a division of McDermott International in Houston, Texas. We'll be talking about his involvement in the Peachoid project and how he received his PhD at the age of 63 and why professional judgment is so important as an engineer. I'm your co-host, Matt Cardle. And I'm your co-host, Kara Green. Now let's jump into our conversation of the week with Greg. Greg, welcome to the show. Now we've already introduced you, but in your own words, can you tell us a little bit about what you do daily at CBNI? Well, sure. Uh, I'm a senior principal structural engineer, and that gives me a really diverse set of duties within CBNI. I serve as the engineer record for uh, a lot of CBI projects where we provide large field directed storage tanks and push vessels, and they're used in oil and gas, water and wastewater, bulk handling power and aerospace industries. Then internally, I serve as a technical authority for seismic wind engineering. So in that role, I provide consulting to various internal CBI and McDermott engineering groups related to the application of seismic and wind standards. And I get to do this on projects all over the world. And because of this expertise, CBI sponsors me uh, or has sponsored my participation on ASC7 for the last 25 years. And I also mentor and train young engineers in our company, uh, especially in the areas of seismic and wind engineering. Thanks, Greg. Uh, CB and I, I believe they've also designed the Peachoid, which is a 135 foot tall water tower in Gaffney, South Carolina. And I've heard of it. I, I remember seeing the structure I, and they even talked about it in some like mainstream shows. I believe it was house of cards and it's basically a water tower that resembles a peach. That must have been an interesting project. Could you tell us more about that project and what went into it and the story behind that and designing it? Well, absolutely. So first of all, you know, be, to be honest, as a young engineer, when it was designed and built, uh, I wasn't directly involved but we all knew about the Peachoid within CBI. So uh, elevated water towers, um, along with providing you know, the engineering stuff, water pressure needed for fire protection, so you can wash your clothes, flush your toilets uh, for your community. Uh, it usually gives cities and towns their own unique personality and sense of pride. Um, many water towers display the town's name, uh, city logo, local sports team. So everyone from miles around knows where they are. There are also uh, water towers across the country built by CB&I. They resemble milk bottles, ketchup bottles, baseballs, billiard balls, <laughs> golf balls, and smiley faces. <laughs> so the, the peach oil uh, is built for the city of Daphne, South Carolina. It was designed to resemble a peach because peach production was an important segment of Gaffney's economy. And the people of Gaffney wanted the whole world to know that Gaffney, South Carolina, Produce more peaches in the peach state of Georgia. They're very <laughs> proud of that. 
Oh, I love that. And that is so funny because that was my comment is I feel as though the peachoid would sit so perfectly in Georgia, especially considering the fact that Georgia has its own water issues. Like they are constantly trying to steal water from the neighboring states. (laughs) So, so, um, you know, obviously a water tower, I'm in my brain and you'll have to forgive me because I didn't know about the peach void. I had never heard of it. Um, obviously with something of that caliber of that shape, you know, you have different challenges that you face face when like designing them maybe around, I don't know too much about, uh, seismic loads in maybe South Carolina, but maybe those are present or specific wind loads. I mean, that's a large structure, uh, to kind of divert wind around. Can you explain what some of the challenges you faced were? Well, sure. Uh, first of all, well, it looks like a peach. The underlying structure is actually uh, a stator type of elevated water tank, CBI developed, called the water spheroid. We built the first water sphere, which was a true sphere. Um, and it looks like a big golf ball on a tee in 1939. And in 1952, we built the first water spheroid which allows for larger capacities without having um, really large um, um, water head that, that makes the pressure vary too much. So seismically, the peach oil is no different than any other water spheroid we design. That's very straightforward. Um, single degree of freedom system, big mass uh, on top of a pedestal. But wind design uh, was challenging. As originally envisioned, the large leaf uh, that's on top of the peachoid was intended just to be an ornamental, be out of ornamental sheet metal. But this ornamental leaf also had to resist the 100 mile an hour design wind that the tank was designed for. <laughs> so that meant that simple ornamental leaf had to be heavily stiffened to resist the wind loads. Yeah, it's great that you mentioned, obviously, that you're in Houston, Texas, which I know has extremely high wind loads, especially when you start getting down to the coast in Galveston. But sheet metal is like a like a sail, especially if it's sitting yes. on top of a peach. Exactly. <laughs> thanks for thanks for that, Greg. Uh, another interesting thing that I wanted to talk about was you received your PhD in civil engineering at the young age of 63. Can you tell us how did that even happen? What made you do it? And maybe what's your opinion on that in in terms of maybe lifelong learning? Because it seems like, hey, 63, maybe some people might think they learned everything, but no, you're you're going after it at at 63 and getting your PhD. Well, sure. Well, first thing, it it is possible to teach an old dog new tricks. (laughs) Um, So I really enjoy learning. And one thing about learning is that the more you learn, the more you realize what you don't know. So I, I believe in taking advantage of opportunities that are presented to me. So my PhD wasn't my first uh, excursion to lifelong learning. Um, I joined CBI in 1980 uh, with a, just, a, I shouldn't say just the BS, but with a BS in civil engineering. So in 1988, I went back to a school at night, University of Houston, and was awarded an MBA in 1991. And then um, because of my close association with Texas Tech, uh, Dr. Scott Norville of Texas Tech, gave me the opportunity to take several graduate civil engineering classes. And before I knew it, I had an MS in civil engineering in 2009. So a few years later, Scott convinced me to go all the way and work on a PhD. And uh, while my job at CBI and my SEI committee responsibilities are challenging, I did need at the time a, a different kind of challenge. I definitely got one. Performing physical and analytical research, writing journal papers, writing and defending a dissertation at Texas Tech, which is in Lubbock, which is about a 90 minute flight or a nine hour drive from Houston, uh, definitely qualifies as a challenge. So this story makes me the poster child of lifelong learning. And I strongly believe in lifelong learning. And I think it's part of being a professional. So all engineers should engage in lifelong learning, whether it's formal or informal. They don't have to go back for a PhD at 63. They really do need to keep learning. No, and that's great feedback for our audience, um, especially since you are living the lifelong learning story. And something that you mentioned, you know, you 
especially with how technology and engineering principles, I mean, the basic core engineering principles haven't really changed much, but how to attempt new design methodologies have changed. And there have been updates. Um, you know, you mentioned you're, you're with ASCE, you've worked with SEI. I know they come out with like new design codes or design guides to help approach certain problems that have never been approached before. Um, so I think that's really great. Uh, advice to our listeners, because uh, it's just, I think, mm, what's the best way to put this? It's when you limit yourself to what you have learned, let's say it's just in your undergrad, you know, just, just your basic, you know, bachelor. So I'm talking about myself, you know, <laughs> cause that's all I have. Um, you know, it's good to kind of take that next step to further your education, whether it be through a postgraduate degree or through, um, you know, ASCE organizations, professional organizations do a lot of continuing education to help keep professionals up to date on yes. um, new trends in the industry and that sort of thing. And, and, you know, you've been really involved in professional organizations like ASCE and SEI to j name a few, you know, uh, you know, we talked, talked a little bit about lifelong learning, but do you have any other, um, how would you say it? Like, what would be important for engineers to get involved in these societies and how has it benefited your engineering career? You know, did, did that help you with your lifelong learning? Could you tie Could you tell our listeners a little bit more? Well, sure. Participating in professional societies is another part of being a professional. So it's a great way to get back to the profession, getting involved in professional practice issues, or developing codes and standards, or just advocating for the profession. And a professional society is a great place to network and learn from others. Uh, Will Rogers said a man only learns in two ways, one by reading and the other by association with smarter people. And joining and being active in a professional society like ASCE or SEI, is the best way to learn by association with smarter people. And believe me, there are a lot of very smart people in ASCE and SEI. And uh, I've been a member of ASCE since I was a freshman at Texas Tech, uh, which was a long time ago. Uh, my professors were very active in ASCE, both at state and national levels. Uh, I became active in ASCE and SEI at the national level uh, through my membership on ASCE 7. As I volunteered to take on more responsibilities on the committee, I learned more and more about my profession and became a much better structural engineer. And because of that, I was able to carry that back or carry back what I learned to CBI, which made me a much better engineer for my employer. Yeah, thanks for that, Greg. I definitely agree. Uh, for me, it's uh, I'm still in the younger, I'm in like my ASCE uh, YMF group and just even just being remotely involved uh, with a group like that, definitely, it's it's the people you meet, and you get to see all of their connections and their insights as well, and giving back to the community. I, I know all of us couldn't have gotten to where we're at in our professional careers without uh, people helping us out, the professionals helping us out, and it's, it's a great way to great way to give back and learn and contribute, and hopefully, if uh, even if they get up to where you're at maybe more of the national level, you can see the benefits that you've received from that. So uh, definitely that's something that we highly encourage here. I think uh, we've seen a, a lot of benefits from the professional organizations. Yeah, it's something that we see when talking to all these different types of engineers as well. It's one of the things that are in common. You can't do it alone and uh, right. professionals, professional societies are a great way. Yeah, and I'll, I'll even kind of mirror what Matt said. A lot of the, you know, very successful engineers that we have spoken to, you know, in earlier channels or on, in earlier episodes, you know, that seems to be a common denominator is that they all have some sort of involvement in one of the professional societies, whether it be ASCE, you know, uh, I was about to say SEI, but SEI is a subsector of ASC. Right. <laughs> um, uh, what is the other one? The Structural Engineers Association. Well, it's CSEA and, and in mm -hmm. Texas, it's, it's CEOPT. Yeah, yeah. See, I, I mean, when I was in Houston, I used to attend those and it was one of my favorite things is always the case studies that they would do a review oh, yeah. of, of the projects, you know, just kind of like what we're talking about today, all of the really fun stuff 
that made a project challenging. Um, <laughs> it was really fun. <laughs> Yeah, Greg, uh, the last topic that uh, I wanted to bring up was that uh, we know structural engineers have good uh, judgment skills. Uh, however, what about professional judgment? It's not really something that can be really formally taught or maybe even learned. Do you have any tips on how engineers can develop and, and build these professional judgment skills and what professional judgment is to you? Well, sure. Now, unfortunately, professional judgment is a skill that uh, can't easily be taught or learned in school. Uh, professional judgment is only something you learn over time from experience and often from bad experience. So, but however, there are many experienced engineers in the profession develop very good professional judgment skills and young engineers should seek these uh, more experienced engineers out and learn from them. And the first place to start is your own organization. Try to find a mentor in your organization and learn from that mentor's experiences and mistakes. Then another great place for young engineers to find mentors is a professional society, such as uh, SEI. It's another great reason to get involved in professional society. Yeah, and I know uh, even with those societies, I've seen more and more mentorship type programs pop up too. So uh, it's getting easier and easier to, to find people that can uh, mentor. And, and with the professional judgment, are you talking about uh, kind of like engineering judgment on lessons learned on um, like buildings and whatnot? Yes, uh, absolutely. And um, it, it could be simple things. You, you can't always model a structure uh, entirely. You, you make simplifications. Um, you, you may see something on drawings or uh, during erection uh, that you realize is wrong based on your experience. Um, one of my favorite adages is, if it looks wrong, it probably is. But a lot of that is gained through experience. And so that uh, uh, helps mold your judgments. Because while you know software is great, uh, it can, you can find out lots of, um, or answer a lot of questions using the software, sometimes you have to make decisions that software really can't help you with. Yep, and that's something that software can't replace, uh, <laughs> at least probably not in our lifetimes, or right. I don't think ever <laughs> it'll be a while. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's it's uh, it's interesting because I remember when I was a, a younger engineer just starting out, I would always be amazed, like maybe I'd come up with an answer or size. And then you talk to the more senior engineers and like, no, just taking a look at your design, like, no, that's something's <laughs> off. And it's like, how do you know? <laughs> but, you know, as you get more and more uh, years of experience, like definitely experience, then you can, uh, you know, when I'm talking to younger engineers now too, it's since you have so much experience in that, you kind of or, already know the answer uh, or what it should look like at least uh, before even doing like software calc. So yeah, definitely something, again, the importance just the importance of mentorship because all those things, you know, I definitely learned from my seniors as well. Absolutely. Yeah. I would even say the same thing. I've been really fortunate that like I have had a mentorship, I would say in my company, but they've also been with professional organizations. So one of my very first supervisors out of college was the president of ASCE in Alabama, in Huntsville, Alabama. And, you know, it was when I first started, it was so great because I was a junior engineer and, you know, junior engineers get to do everything on a project yes. because they're cheap labor. <laughs> so <laughs> they, have, they have a lower. Well, um, they also want you to be trained. See, that's. <laughs> Yes, but she, it was always so much fun because she would, you know, she had a work truck when we would both go. And some of my best experiences were, would be, were, would be being out on a job and she would, you know, see something and be like, you know, what's wrong here? you know, and she would let me figure it out or she would help. I would say she would let me figure it out. She would help my thought process yes. move to what was wrong. <laughs> <Huh>. So, <laughs> so yeah, I think mentorship is great. And I think a lot of companies, you know, you mentioned a lot about the, um, 
mentorship that's available in professional organizations. And I think a lot of companies are trying to mirror what is available in the professional organizations within their own companies as well, yes. because they really see um, the success of their younger engineers kind of flourish under mentorship. I know at, at Hilti, we have a huge mentoring program to kind of get, get all of our younger engineers because we do get them. And a lot of times they're fresh out of college. And uh, I can, I think we can all agree that theory in college is very hard to translate to on the job, like <laughs> reading plans and specifications yes. <laughs> can be a difficult process to really digest when you've, all you've done is look at equations sometimes. Um, but Greg, and, and to end off here, you know, we do have a lot of structural engineers. Some may be looking for that next step, maybe getting a graduate degree. I'll raise my hand, you know, um, or, you know, for our younger engineers in the audience who are trying to learn from the more tenured uh, engineers in the industry, you know, what's the last final piece of advice that you could give uh, for engineers in the structural industry? Well, sure. I, I would strongly... You know, the simple, and this is actually simple to do, strongly urge my fellow structural engineers to become involved in structural engineering societies, such as SEI or SEOF here in Texas. Um, the more you participate in professional society, the better so the society becomes, the better structural engineer you become. And it's not overnight, but uh, you're better off participating in these societies than not by, by a, a long shot. Yeah, thanks so much, Greg. That's great advice. I know it's intimidating, especially for younger engineers. Uh, maybe if they wanted, for example, do like a tech committee or maybe get involved in like the masonry committee, but they're still young and they don't know much. Well, that it's kind of like the chicken and the egg. Like the people that I've talked to that were involved in those was, well, they got to be an expert because they joined those uh, societies or organizations and they learned from the experts. So they became an expert themselves. They didn't start off like that. So it's, that's definitely great advice and something that can be intimidating, but uh, definitely worthwhile. So and, thanks. Well, well, sure. And, and to build on that, uh, SEI um, in, in the structural standards side, uh, we have gone out of our way to uh, appoint young members as secretaries, historians, in our various subcommittees on ASC 7. And they get to, uh, they get to do a lot of the, the work that the older guys don't want to do. <laughs> we learn a lot from that. And uh, that's what we're, we're trying to, uh, at an earlier age, uh, get these younger engineers involved and so they can uh, get up to speed uh, sooner. Yeah, you got to start somewhere. And um, it's... Uh... And if you're like an engineer that complains about the codes and whatnot, well, if you're not on the committee, you can't really complain you know, or things like that. Yeah. Like get on there, make a difference. You know, don't, exactly. don't let other engineers, <laughs> you be the engineer that, that helps shape the code to, to what you want it to be. So and, and you can go sign up for it to uh, participate on ASC 728 uh, on the SEI website. Yeah, definitely check that out. Oh, um, perfect. Yeah. And I think one thing that it hasn't been mentioned, but maybe in the mentorship, it's also networking. A lot of our younger engineers, I, me and Matt have talked about this, or when I was a younger engineer, networking was so frightening. But I think a lot of engineers who do have a bit more tenure, especially in these organization, organizations, recognize that. And they, I mean, I remember when I moved to Houston, like fresh like fresh in Houston, didn't know anyone in the industry, you know, everyone was super welcoming, especially and, and around that education piece, like they are more than willing to bring you up to speed on certain topics. Well, absolutely. And you find out a lot of older engineers like to talk. So you can just get them started and, and listen to them. Free knowledge. There we go. Exactly. <laughs> You're getting a free course. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much again, Greg, today. It was a great conversation. I really enjoyed learning about the peach oil a little bit. Like I said, it's so odd that it's not in Georgia and that Georgia yes. does not have a peach, 
but <laughs> South Carolina, and as long as they're keeping up their peach production, I guess they're not taking the peachoid down anytime soon. <laughs> That's right. Uh, again, thank you for inviting me. I really enjoyed this. I hope you enjoyed the episode today. We'd love to hear your feedback, comments, and or questions. To leave them, please visit structuralengineeringchannel.com. There you'll find a summary of the key points discussed in today's episode, which is episode number 71, as well as links to any of the resources, websites, or books mentioned during this episode. Don't forget to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Until next time, we wish you the best in all of your structural engineering endeavors.